On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including the James Webb Space Telescope completing its first image stacking, NASA's SLS launch of Artemis 1 inching slowly closer to reality, SpaceX responds to Starlink criticism, and Rocket Lab has a fancy new launch pad in New Zealand. So let's get going. This is the Space Race. The James Webb Space Telescope is now yet another step closer to becoming fully operational. In a saga that we have been following very closely, this powerful infrared telescope that is positioned beyond the moon at a Lagrange point called L2 is in the process of aligning its 18 gold-plated hexagon mirrors until they all function as one singular mirror dish. The first image that NASA released was of 18 stars scattered around the frame. They explained that it was actually 18 photos of the same star, each captured by one of those segment mirrors, visualizing their misalignment. The next image was each of those 18 points of light matched and aligned in a hexagon pattern to the mirror segment that it represents. Now, the NASA teams have completed the segment alignment and image stacking, bringing those 18 points of light to one. A reminder that these are just the second and third out of seven total phases of mirror alignment after moving what were 18 scattered dots of starlight into Webb's signature hexagonal formation, the team refined each mirror segment's image by making minor adjustments, while also changing the alignment of Webb's secondary mirror, that's the little one held out at the end of the tripod. The completion of this process, known as segment alignment, was a key step prior to overlapping the light from all the mirrors so they can work in unison. Once segment alignment was achieved, the focus dots reflected by each mirror were then stacked on top of each other, delivering photons of light from each segment to the same location on the camera's sensor. During this process, called image stacking, the team activated sets of six mirrors at a time and commanded them to repoint their light to overlap until all dots of starlight overlapped with each other. NASA says that although image stacking put all the light from a star in one place on the camera's sensor, the mirror segments are still acting as 18 small telescopes rather than one big one. The segments now need to be lined up to each other with an accuracy smaller than the wavelength of the light. Next up, the team will start the fourth phase of mirror alignment known as coarse phasing. In this, the camera is used to capture light from 20 different pairings of the mirror segments. This helps the team identify and correct small differences in the heights of each segment. This will make the single dot of starlight progressively sharper and more focused in the coming weeks. Another week, another updated timeline on the NASA Space Launch System rocket, and along with it, the Artemis 1 mission to lunar orbit. NASA now expects to roll out the SLS rocket for the first time in mid-March for a dress rehearsal. That rollout is scheduled to begin at 6 p.m. Eastern Time on March 17th, and even after it arrives at the pad, this is going to be a lengthy round of pre-flight exercises. SLS will spend about a month at the pad undergoing tests, highlighted by a tanking test and practice countdown called a wet dress rehearsal about two weeks after rollout. The core stage will be filled with liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen propellants and then go through a practice countdown that will stop at T-9.34 seconds just before the core stage's four RS-25 engines would ignite during an actual launch. Basically coming as close to launch as possible to make sure that everything is doing what it's supposed to. Remember the Boeing Starling incident last year where the valves got stuck prior to launch and the whole thing had to be scrapped? NASA does not want any surprises like that, putting the kibosh on Artemis 1. This is already getting embarrassing as it is with all of the delays. Failing at the 11th hour would be the nail in the coffin. At the end of the wet dress rehearsal, the vehicle will roll back again to the vehicle assembly building for the final launch preparations. That includes resolving any issues found during the test, as well as charging batteries on the Orion spacecraft, and updating flight computer software on SLS. NASA expects these final preparations to take another month. They have no plans to set a final launch date until after the wet dress rehearsals go through. It's a smart move. Don't count the chickens before they hatch, especially when those chickens were built by Boeing. 
Though, you might remember from a month ago, we reported NASA was hopeful on an April launch date. They are now saying that is out of the question. Apparently, NASA is eyeing the earliest possibility being the tail end of the May launch window, which runs from May 7th to 21st. Future launch windows governed by orbital mechanics and other mission constraints like a splashdown during daylight hours are going to be between June 6th to 16th and June 29th to July 12th. NASA have confirmed that no components of the SLS vehicle come from Russia or Ukraine, and they don't expect the conflict to affect the supply chain for the mission. They basically admitted that most of the SLS is just recycled space shuttle hardware, which is shocking in the fact that it's now 40-year-old technology, but it's actually now working out in their favor, so the more power to them. Last week, we talked about NASA writing an open letter that expressed some concerns they had over Starlink. It wasn't exactly harsh criticism, just a list of things to consider. Now SpaceX have released an official response as an update on their website. In the post, SpaceX has reaffirmed the company's commitment to being good citizens of outer space and prioritizing sustainable satellite operations, saying, quote, SpaceX is deeply committed to maintaining a safe orbital environment, protecting human spaceflight, and ensuring the environment is kept sustainable for future missions to Earth, orbit, and beyond. SpaceX also took aim directly at NASA's assumption that no satellite constellation could possibly be 100% safe. They write, The reliability of the satellite network is currently higher than 99%, following the deployment of over 2,000 satellites, where only 1% have failed after orbit raising. There are quite a few interesting points made in the SpaceX update. They say early on that they now have the capacity to build up to 45 Starlink satellites per week and have launched up to 240 of them in a single month, which is an unprecedented rate of development for advanced space systems. They also talk about how the design of the satellite itself prioritizes safety. They reduce the chance small debris will damage the satellite by using a low-profile chassis and using Whipple shields to protect the key components reducing risk of explosion with extensive battery pack protection and failure modes that do not create secondary debris. As we already know, Starlink satellites are propulsively deorbited when they reach the end of their life. To do this, they reserve enough propellant in the thrusters to deorbit from operational altitude, and this process takes roughly four weeks. Once they get low enough in orbit, the satellite will initiate a high drag mode, which basically causes it to slow down so drastically that it just falls towards the Earth and burns up. SpaceX actually details entirely the process of a Starlink burning up, and it's pretty interesting. They write, When a satellite altitude decays, it encounters a constantly increasing atmospheric density. Initially, these molecules impact the satellite, but as the air density increases, a high-pressure shockwave forms in front of the spacecraft. As the satellite slows down and descends into the atmosphere, its orbital energy is transferred into the air, heating it to a plasma. The hot plasma sheath envelops the satellite, causing intense heating. Starlink satellites are designed to demise as they re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, meaning they pose no risk to people or property on the ground. SpaceX says they have safely deorbited over 200 satellites using this approach. This is also the reason that SpaceX deploys Starlink at such a low altitude, less than 350 kilometers high. If the satellite does not pass the initial system checks or fails to activate, then this atmospheric density will make short work of it. Even at their fully operational altitude, the Starlink satellites are still vulnerable to this atmospheric drag because SpaceX never raises them above 600 kilometers altitude. This sweet spot between 500 and 600 kilometers is what SpaceX calls a self-cleaning orbit, meaning that even a totally dead, non-maneuverable satellite will lose altitude and deorbit due to atmospheric drag within five to six years and often sooner. At any altitude past 800 kilometers, a dead satellite would take a hundred years or more to actually come back down. SpaceX say they have invested considerable effort and expense in developing satellites that would fly at these lower altitudes, including investment in sophisticated altitude and propulsion systems. SpaceX also makes the point that they transparently and continuously share the details of all Starlink locations 
with national governments and private satellite operators. SpaceX also shares very accurate future positions and velocity predictions for all of their satellites. And lastly, SpaceX talks about their collision avoidance system. The company states, To accomplish safe space operations in a scalable way, SpaceX has developed and equipped every SpaceX satellite with an onboard autonomous collision avoidance system that ensures it can maneuver to avoid potential collisions with other objects. If there is a greater than 1 in 100,000 probability of collision, which is 10 times lower than the industry standard of 1 in 10,000, for a conjunction, satellites will plan avoidance maneuvers. When planning a maneuver for any conjunction, the satellites take care to avoid inadvertently increasing risk for other conjunctions above the same threshold. And one interesting point that they make that I didn't even know before is that Starlink satellites can duck out of the way in a close call. So each satellite has that gigantic solar array attached that dwarfs the actual satellite chassis itself. SpaceX says that the satellite will initiate a duck maneuver, where the satellite reorients that solar array to have the smallest possible surface area in the direction of the possible collision. Like when you're walking through a crowded area and you turn sideways to avoid running into people. Very clever. The company concluded their update by saying, Ultimately, space sustainability is a technical challenge that can be effectively managed with the appropriate assessment of risk, the exchange of information, and the proper implementation of technology and operational controls. Together, we can assure that space is available for humanity to use and explore for generations to come." End quote. Rocket Lab has been working on adding multiple launch locations for its Electron rocket over the past few years, and finally, the company's second pad in New Zealand is ready to go and loaded with dual rockets. Launch Complex 1B in New Zealand is Rocket Lab's newest addition to its launch facilities. This pad shares infrastructure with Pad A, including three satellite clean rooms, a launch vehicle, assembly hangar, and administrative offices. Rocket Lab Vice President Sean DeMello said in a statement, With Pad B, we've kept things efficient. Its systems and layout replicates Pad A and shares much of Pad A's infrastructure. With that, we've been able to double our operational capacity, all on a concrete area smaller than the average tennis court. I'm hugely proud of what the team has achieved, end quote. That means doubled launch capability for the Electron rocket, and when paired with Rocket Lab's North American launch site in Virginia, the company can now support up to 132 launch opportunities per year. One of those opportunities this year will begin on March 19th, when Rocket Lab's Electron has the task of sending NASA's Capstone spacecraft to orbit around the moon. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.